All right, go ahead and go to Exodus 18 in one hand and Numbers 11 in the other. And Gorski, you were that close. <laughs> and I'm actually preaching on something he said in his message. And he talked about Satan's influence. And I have a subtitle for my sermon because I wasn't really sure if I should give it. But I'm just going to give it Satan's advice. And so that's it. It's, uh, so I just want to say uh, graciously that um, what I'm going to give you is I'm standing on the shoulders of the, of the gleanings of other men. Uh, I didn't actually know this was bad advice until I uh, uh, had heard Dr. Uckman talk about it. And I'm like, oh, but he didn't really elaborate on it. And so as I began to study the passage, I realized it was bad advice. Uh, kind of like there are some things that people accept over time that have been said over and over again. They just kind of accept it. Uh, it's just become part of what we think. For example, some people think that it is a scripture verse to say, spare the rod, spoil the child. Uh, some people think that, right? And, and you know, it's not. Uh, let me give you one that I thought was uh, a Bible verse or uh, the way the Bible verse was supposed to be quoted, and then I found out through preaching that it wasn't. Um, now, don't, don't say anything, please, okay? I know you guys are excited, but just hold it for a second. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to quote it wrong, and, and then see if you guys can, and when I point to you, then you tell me what the right word is. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Ah, exactly. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. But I thought it was set you free for so many years. I thought it was. And, uh, and then, I'll, well, that's not what it says. It says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Yeah. So a lot of people have taken uh, the passage that I'm going to get to, and it's, uh, it's uh, uh, Moses' father-in-law. And I'm, by the way, I'm very conscientious of the time. I know we have to eat afterwards. Uh, but at the same time, we're just going to go with uh, the leading of the Holy Spirit. All right? Yeah. So the fellow in our passage, his name is Jethro. <laughs> That's probably a good southern name. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so he gives some advice. And a lot of people have taken the advice that this is good advice. But actually, I'm gonna, I, I would like you just withhold judgment until you've seen the whole thing. But I'm, I'm going to show you that it's actually bad advice and how it didn't work. And it wasn't until the Lord stepped in and did something for Moses that then he was able to do something. And I'm going to give you like the answer like right up front. I'm just going to give it to you in the introduction and then we'll break it down as we go through it. So like I said, I'm standing on the shoulders of other men and what they've gleaned from this passage. This message will not plumb the depths of this passage, but it should give you a good start into thinking about whose advice are you going to follow? Are you going to follow man's advice or are you going to follow God's advice? And as you'll see, like in our previous message, there was Satan's influence. This advice is not from the Lord. As a matter of fact, Moses never even asks the Lord about the advice if it was okay or not. All right, uh, Je uh, well, I guess I should read the passage and then we need to pray. Verse eight, chapter 18 of Exodus and verse 1. I'll get to Numbers 11 when I get there. Now, it says, When Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, and that God had brought Israel out of Egypt, then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back, and her two sons, of which the name of the one was Gershom, for he said, I have been an alien in a strange land, and the name of the other was Eliezer, for the God of my father he said he was mine help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife unto Moses into the camp where he encamped at the mount of God. And he said unto Moses, I thy father-in-law Jethro am come unto thee and thy wife and her two sons with her. Okay, let's pray. My father, I thank you for today and I thank you for the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, I do not have the ability to preach this message today. But my father, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. So Lord, I ask that you would please let me be small and let you be big. Father, decrease me and increase yourself. Lord, I selfishly ask that you would please give me a divine unction from on high. Give these people a divine unction. Lord, let us together listen to your message. Father, I pray that if there's any spirit that is contrary to the Holy Spirit of God, that you would rebuke it in the name of Jesus Christ and get it out of here. I do ask that you would cover me in the blood and forgive me of all of my sins. Father, I know if anyone can mess this message up, it is me. Now, Lord, if we don't get anything out of it, it's either our fault, but it's never your fault. So, Father, we ask now that you would be in our midst. Please come in and sup with us, Lord. We felt your presence here a moment ago as we were shouting. 
Father, help us now as we turn to the book that you exalted above your very name and we glean some things from its text. In the precious name of Jesus, we ask this. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, Jethro is not a priest of God. He's a priest of Midian. That's found in verse number one. So I need to take that into account. Uh, The second thing that I need to tell you about Jethro is that when Jethro comes to Moses and, he, and they kind of meet, they have been away for a while, they meet up together, there's kind of like a, hey, how are you doing? They begin to talk about things. Moses tells them everything that happened and how God, God brought them out of Egypt, how all the wonderful things that the Lord did for them. And this is what Jethro says in verse 11. He goes, now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. For in the thing wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. So it's only now that he knows that. So understand that the advice that's coming is from a guy who just the day before just admitted who the right God was. So he's not even a priest of God, he's a priest of Midian. And it was only that day that he saw it. And that was after hearing all these wonderful things and testimonies and how the Lord brought him through it. Now, you know how you give a testimony. When you give a testimony, usually you give the high points of the testimony. Uh, If you do touch the low points, it's kind of pretty quick. But even the person that's listening to the testimony, they don't feel it like you felt it when you were going through it. You know it. You know what it's like to go through the low points. Here's Jethro. He's hearing all these great things. You got the manna. You got all this cool stuff happening. Wow, this is amazing. I drowned all the children of Israel in the... the, I'm not children of Israel. He He didn't drown the children of Israel. Oh, man. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. It's, I told you, if, I, if anybody could mess it up, I'd mess it up. <laughs> he drowned the Egyptians uh, in the Red Sea. And he heard, he heard about all that. I, I'm pretty sure that Moses did not include in there when God said, go tell Pharaoh, I'm going to kill your firstborn if you don't let my firstborn go. And he didn't say it the first time. I'm sure he didn't. I'm sure he might have left that part out. You know how it is. How we sometimes when we give testimonies, and I'm not telling you, don't go airing all the dirty laundry. I don't want to hear it, okay? We don't need to know all the times you messed up. Just brag on him. That's all you got to do. So Jethro comes up. He's got a very limited time of God's dealing with Moses. And now he thinks because he's been there and because he's somebody, he's got something to say. And so here's what happens in verse 13. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people and the people stood by Moses from morning unto the evening. So he's sitting there. All the people are coming to Moses and Jethro's standing back. He's watching this and I want to, I'm going to point out some words. Verse 14, and when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, what is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thyself alone? Why sittest thyself alone? And all the people stand by thee from morning unto even. And Moses said unto his father-in-law, Because the people come unto me to inquire of God. When they have a matter, they come to me, and I judge between one and another, and I do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. While Gorski was preaching, he talked about how you guys have been hitting on 2 Timothy 4.2. I said, boy, that's a great place to insert 2 Timothy 4.2. Preach the word. That's our job. Moses' job is to tell them, this is what God says. That's my job as a preacher. This is what God says. Any preacher that stands behind the pulpit and preaches, it's him and God. Not his wife, not his kids, not your opinion, not his friends, nothing. It's him and God to tell you the word of the Lord. So Moses is sitting there and he's doing that and he asks him, why are you sitting alone? Verse 17, and Moses father-in-law said unto him the thing that thou doest is not good doc has a note there it says he doesn't say it's not right he says it's not good that's what because see jethro you're going to find out the advice is we want to find out what's good for moses basically what's going to make it easier how can we make this ministry easier on you how can we make the christian life easier for you so it's not so hard I got that, that's basically what this advice is going to be. He says in verse 18, Gorski read this, Thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee. By the way, I'd rather be wearing away doing this than wearing away out there. Thou shalt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee. For this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. 
All right, for sake of time, as you keep reading down through this text, you'll find out that here was Jethro's advice. Jethro's advice was pick you out some able men. Verse 21. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men. And then he gives some character traits that he's supposed to find, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. I would like for anybody to stand up right now in this room and point out 10 people that you know their heart, that they are fearing God, men of truth, hating covetousness, that you know what's going on in their heart. You don't know that. What do you know about the heart of a man other than that yours is wicked? Actually, that's not true. It is not wicked. It's desperately wicked. Amen. Amen. Now, notice what Moses does is Moses, in verse 25, and Moses chose out able men out of all Israel. In verse 21, that is Jethro talking. In verse 25, that's the Holy Spirit talking. Did you notice what the Holy Spirit did not say? What he says is just as important what he didn't say. He didn't say that any of those men feared God, men of truth, hating covetousness. But he did say they were able men. Here's the thing. Jethro's advice is to get able men that can help Moses with the ministry. But God is not first looking for able men. He is looking for faithful, spirit-filled men. Amen. Your talent does not impress God. Man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. God doesn't care how fast you can run, how high you can jump, how high your IQ is, how smart you are, how good you can sing, how well organized you are. God is looking for faithful, spirit-filled men. Now these able men here, we find these able men, actually, they don't get the job done. And I cannot tell you how many times I have tried to find able men to insert them into a spot so they can help get the job done. But I'm telling you, it's not able men that we need. We need spirit-filled men. In this text, in this text, we go from, we go from able men and, and Jethro gets, says, get able men in the hopes that they will eventually be faithful and spirit-filled. Now, he doesn't say that, but knowing my own heart and knowing how I've done things in the past, there seems to be something, a thought that has come into my mind, which now I know where it came from, that I figured that if I got an able man in the position, that somewhere along the way he would be faithful and then he would be spirit-filled. But that's not the way God does it. God says, you give me faithful, spirit-filled men, and I'll make them able. <laughs> All right, now the first thing I want to point out is I want you to notice the loneliness of the ministry. In verse 14, he says, why sittest thou, thou, why sittest thou thyself alone? Do you guys see that in verse 14? Okay. Now Jethro looks at Moses sitting alone, and he finds fault. But I want to tell you, many great men in the Bible spent time alone. Jacob wrestled alone. Gideon threshed alone. David went down into a valley to fight Goliath alone. Don't be the kind of person who can't be alone, alone with God. Moses was sitting there to make the people know the statutes of God. He was not alone. Somebody was with him. And he told him, when you get to this spot, when you get to this spot, that's how you're going to know I'm with you. You see, if you'll go, if you hold your place here and go to Exodus chapter 3, Exodus 3, Exodus chapter 3 and verse 12, and he said, well, verse 11, And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee. And this shall be, the to be a token unto thee that I have sent thee when thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. The place they were at was a token that God said he would give them to prove that he was with them. 
Moses was not just sitting there alone. God was with him. Bob Jones Sr. used to say, you and God and your community make up the majority. You remember that. That's why you need to learn to spend time alone with God. I'm not talking about this just, you know, five minutes here, ten minutes. I'm talking about you get alone with God without your phone. Get along with them. Amen. Now, <clears throat> I think that what happened is uh, sometimes uh, we do start to think we're all alone. Uh, and uh, Moses, as he gets going on, he kind of gets to whining and complaining about this thing a little later on. And, you know, I'm bearing these people as a nursing father. He begins to think he's a little bit alone. Elijah got like that. I heard a good message by Nathan Bemis. I'm going to steal a part of his message. He said that uh, the Lord sent Elijah, uh, when, when Elijah ran from Jezebel because he was depressed, he got alone, and then he slept. The Lord wakes him up and he eats. And then he sleeps, and he wakes him up and he eats, and he says, the journey's great. And then he goes, and he goes to Horeb, the Mount of God. And that's, that's Mount Sinai. That's holy ground. And... He goes there and, and uh, he goes into a cave. And when he gets into that cave, the Lord comes to him and the Lord says to this, what doest thou here, Elijah? And Nathan Bemis said, he looked at that and he said, God, why would you ask Elijah, what doest thou here, Elijah? Didn't you send him there? Didn't you tell him the journey was great? <laughs> I mean, he went there because you told him to get there. And he was preaching on meditation, on how to meditate on scripture. He says, so I closed my Bible, I went and I laid down in my bed and I began thinking about it and I said, man, this is bothering me. So he went and he got back up, opened up his Bible and he said, what did Elijah respond? And Elijah responded, because I've been jealous for you and all this stuff. And he starts complaining to the Lord about everything, but that's not the reason why he was there. He didn't just be honest and say, well, I'm here because I'm depressed, Lord, and I'm sulking. He, he, he just kind of gave this, you know, I'm the only one, I, I, just me all by myself. And the Lord said, come out of the cave. He said, and so uh, next thing you know, the Lord asked uh, Elijah again, what doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, why in the world did he ask him, what doest thou here, Elijah? But then he went and he read, and Elijah didn't actually come out of the cave. He came to the door of the cave. Go check it out. Came to the door of the cave. He said, and all of a sudden it hit me. Elijah was in the cave, all depressed and sulking, God asked him, what doest thou here, Elijah? He was that close to being on holy ground, but instead he went into a depression and went into a cave. You know when all of a sudden that depression starts hitting you? Like Monday or Sunday night after you get done preaching, you say, boy, that was the worst message I ever preached. <laughs> I got to take your advice and stop recording messages. <laughs> And all of a sudden, you start feeling yourself go down. Realize you're that close to holy ground. Ask God to help bring you out of the cave and put you on holy ground. You know, there was only one person who was really able to go it alone, and that is Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Man, I got to thinking about that. And the brother the other night started talking about how the seraphims are up there hovering and twain come to his feet. Brother, you, you kind of, where are you, brother? You were right here. Oh, there you are. Brother, you set off something in my heart, man. I began to think about that. Boy, that's got to be quite the scene. You got the seraphims all around. Holy, 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 Lord God. Um, and they never get tired of it. And he never gets tired of hearing it. The 24 elders are around the throne. They're shouting. I mean, angels are hollering. They're throwing hymn books and chairs and waving around their robe like that, you know. They're all excited. And all of a sudden, they say, God the Father says it's time. And the angels say, it's time for what? It's time for my son to go down there and walk a path that no man on earth is able to walk or ever will be able to walk. And he's going to walk that path and he's going to walk it alone. 
And the seraphims all of a sudden began to droop their wings and say, Oh, Father, please send me in His majesty's stead. I will go. And the Father said, No, you cannot go in His stead. Because if you go, you'll go out of love for Him. But I'm sending Him out of love for them. You cannot go. And about that time, the angel said, Please, let us go down there. Please, Your Majesty, let us go. No, you're just going to stay back here. And when I get to a garden, I may call on you. But until then, you hold your ranks. And they said, well, maybe we can find a prophet that can go. Maybe we can find one of the saints. You know, if we get a saint, uh, people pray to saints all the time. And the Lord stopped them right there and said, hold on. Praying to the saints won't do you any good. I mean... Let's just face it. The rich man prayed to Abraham and it did him no good. He was still in hell. So praying to a saint ain't going to do you no good. And so the son said, Father, a body hast thou prepared me. I am ready. And he took those royal robes and he laid them aside and set them down there and stepped over the banister of heaven and dropped down through and came and was born of a virgin. And all of heaven watched as he who spoke the world into existence went down and became flesh and dwelt amongst men. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. About that time, he begins to gather some disciples to himself. One time, he had over 5,000 men. You want to talk about Panda Express? Oh, my goodness. You're going to need a lot. (laughs) But he didn't need that. He just said, what you got? And they said, all we got is five loaves and two fishes. And as we heard the other night, that boy was shouting, singing Hosanna when the Pharisees wanted to stop him. (laughs) So there's Jesus. He gets all these people around him. But along about there, some of them in John chapter 6 and verse 66, you've got the first church split that takes place. Interesting, it's John 6, 66. (laughs) And so they leave him. Finally, he comes down and he goes into a garden and he needs somebody to pray with them. And so he takes his three closest disciples and says, come on with me, boys. And they walk and they lay there by the tree. You know, they're going to have prayer meeting with Jesus. And so they get down there and they're like, all right, we're going to pray. We're really going to pray hard. And we're going to, we're going to like. (sighs) And off went Jesus Christ. You know what it says about him? And he went a little further. He gets to praying, and when nobody else is praying, he's praying, he's praying alone. He's the only one that went alone. Finally, they come for him there that night, and they say, hey, that's the one. He says, whom seek ye? Jesus of Nazareth. And he stepped back, and I imagine it with a very firm and calm voice. The breath of God flowed out from his holy lungs, and he says, I am he. And that breath went right out there, smacked those Roman soldiers and put them right back on their backside. They get up again and they say, Jesus says, whom seek ye? (laughs) Jesus of Nazareth? I already told you I am He. Let these go. And off He went alone. But it got more lonely than that. He went there. He was beaten by those Roman soldiers. They took our precious Savior and they nailed Him there on a cross and He took our sin on Him. He became sin for us and with them casting the same in His teeth, mocking Him and saying, come on, physician, come down. The Father turns His head and Jesus says, my God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? He knew what it was like to be alone. Then finally, after he fulfilled every scripture that needed to be fulfilled, they took that body limp down and they laid it in a tomb. They were scrambling. They needed to hurry up because it was a Sabbath. But we got to get back. We got to get back so we can anoint him. Three days and three nights go by, but you know they didn't get to it. I often wonder, I have kind of a weird imagination if you can't tell, and I kind of wonder what was going on. I wonder if they didn't take that body of Jesus and lay him there in that tomb. And all of a sudden, the devil walks up to death and says, Now, death, you got this, right? And death says, Don't you worry about it. There have been many a men who have walked through my door and not one of them has come out. I got this. You go mind your business, I'll mind mine. 
The devil says, now listen, this guy is different. I, I saw you, and when you were about ready to take his life, he laid it down. Are you sure you got this, death? And death says, don't you worry about it, I got it. And so the devil says, all right, I got some partying to go do. And so principality and power start to party it up. Day one goes by. Day two goes by. Day two and a half goes by. The devil shows back up and says, now death, I know you said you got it. But I got to know, do you got it? Is that good English? <laughs> I'm asking the Korean, is that good English? <laughs> Death says, don't you worry about it, I got it. Pilate sent some soldiers along this way. He told them to make it sure as you can. The devil snapped his head, what do you mean as sure as you can? Oh, I, I'm sure he meant nothing by it. <laughs> don't worry about it. <laughs> I got this thing down. That tomb is sealed shut. There's no way that thing is coming open. I'll tell you what, it would take a mighty force to open up that tombstone. And there's no force in the universe that has been able to open that tombstone and it ain't opening it. The devil said, all right, well, I got to go back down. Down he went and he says, all right, lock those gates. And they said, all right, we're going to lock the gates. You got the keys? Yeah, I got them right here. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Who took my keys? <laughs> About that time, Jesus goes, you're looking for these? <laughs> Boy, those gates of hell opened up. They couldn't hold him back. And all of a sudden, principalities and powers said, Death, he's coming. He's coming. Don't you worry about it. I got this. Are you sure he's coming? He's coming. I got this. I got this. And he began to hold. And that ground began to shake. And that took people in. Oh, he came out, he came out alone. Oh, yeah. He didn't need any help. Right. Hey, that's good. That's good, brother. We need his help. Yes. Hey. Amen, now notice in verse 18, notice the lack of ability for the ministry. He said, Thou shalt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Well, it's a pretty bleak picture of the road that he thinks is ahead for Moses. He wants it to be easier for him. In verse 22, he says, And let them judge the people at all seasons, and it shall be that every great matter that shall bring unto thee, they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So it, shall it be easier for thyself. Make it easier, Moses. This is father-in-law. This is family. Sometimes that's where problems come from. They just want it to be easier for you. Sometimes they mean well, but you got to go with what God called you to do. Right. Not what's easier for you. Who said the ministry was going to be easy? Do you think it was going to be easy? Somebody lied to you. You've been listening to the wrong kind of preaching if you think the ministry is easy. Look, if you can't be faithful to come into church, don't even think about getting into ministry. How in the world are you going to prepare a message every single week? How are you going to do that? How are you going to disciple people? How are you going to counsel them? How are you going to go to the, the, uh, the, the hospitals and deal with them? How are you going to handle it when people come to you and their marriage is falling apart? How are, you going to, how are you going to feed them week after week after week, give them something different, something new? How are you going to keep yourself charged up along with everybody else? Don't Just stay out. Stay out. All right? You're not cut out for it. Okay? Now, the ministry is not easy. Nobody said it was going to be easy. The Bible tells us to pick up our cross. Cross. You think the cross was easy for Jesus Christ? It wasn't easy for Jesus Christ. Now, but my Bible tells me, be, let, uh, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. I know I, I'm not trying to paint that the ministry is all bad. It's rough. I'll grant you that. But man, does it have its joys. It sure is a blessing watching that family that you talk to and all of a sudden that husband and wife gets reconciled and things take place. It's a blessing watching somebody try to drive all the way up to San Jose to go every week to church and then walk into the church service and end up getting saved. Amen, Brother Adam? <laughs> it's a blessing watching these things happen, seeing converts that you led to Christ out preaching on the street. There's a lot of blessings in the ministry. 
but the Lord didn't tell you to make it easier for yourself. He tells them it's too heavy. That phrase too heavy is found three times in the Bible. It's found once here. I'm going to show you in a minute where the other one is found, but I'm going to show you legitimately what is too heavy. Go to Psalm 38. Psalm 38. And I say what legitimately is too heavy because the Lord said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me for my yoke is easy and my burden is light and you shall find rest to your souls. Psalm 38. Psalm 38. You will be more, if you're saved, you'll be more miserable out there than you'll ever be in here. Uh, I'll tell you. All right, Psalm uh, 38 and verse 4. For mine iniquities are gone over mine head. As in heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. Sin is too heavy. That's what's too heavy. <clears throat> Jethro told him, he said in the verse, he says, thou art not able. Now, I guess he got that part right. Because <laughs> really, he's not able and none of us are able to do the ministry. We need the Lord to do the ministry for us. All right. Now, Moses must have believed what Jethro told him about it being too heavy and him not being able because this is what he ends up saying to God. So I'm sorry I haven't been there in a while, but go to Numbers chapter 11. I actually haven't been there at all, not even in a while. Numbers 11. And, and notice what, the Lord, what Moses tells the Lord in verse 14. He says, I am not able to bear all this people alone because it is too heavy for me. Those two things is what Jethro told him. He says, you're not able. It's too heavy. That's what he told him. And I don't know what had happened to, to, uh, to Moses. I wonder if Moses kind of got there laying up at night and he began to think about it. And he began to mull it over in his mind. And he began to say, uh, you know, this is too heavy. He's right. I feel the pressure. And I, I'm not able to do this. I mean, there's got to be somebody else who can do it. I mean, there's got to be someone else who God can, can have do this, this work. here. I'm, and he began to go over that thing over and over and over in his mind until finally he just has it out with God. And he tells him, I can't do this thing anymore. I can't do it. Uh, maybe that's you. I want to ask you, who are you getting advice from? He got advice from Jethro here. Maybe you're like this. And look, this is in my notes. Maybe your church is too far away. And so you don't want to go. Because you get advice from somebody telling you that it's too far. Maybe you look ridiculous on a street corner holding a sign. Don't worry about it, you do. <laughs> Maybe you can't read the Bible because you don't read very well. You fall asleep or you don't understand it or whatever million excuses you'd come up with. Read it anyway. Yeah. How many good men have been talked out of doing what God has called them to do because of bad advice? If God called you to do it, do it! Jethro told him that he was not able. At least he got that part right. None of us are able, but God is able. The problem is, is that you think you are able. That is pride. And pride is so sneaky and so deep-rooted in all of us, even in prayer you'll find pride. In preaching you will find pride. It rears its head up all the time. Amen. Amen. Boy, I sure preached a good one that day. <laughs> oh, yeah. Drop the mic. <laughs> Pride is a sneaky, wicked thing that God says he hates. It is satanic, brother. You are right. Right along with sowing discord among the brethren. <laughs> but I want to tell you something. You are not able. But don't let that stop you from doing what God calls you to do. Amen. Because the scripture says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Well, preacher, I've tried and failed before. Well, that's because you didn't try it through Christ. Try it through Christ this time. The Lord's able. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that ye have always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Amen. The Lord's able to get the job done through you. Yes. All right, now last of all, go over to Numbers 11 and we'll be done. I'm wrapping it up. I got to wrap it up. All right, now notice the Lord's pick. Finally, this issue comes to a head and you got to read the whole passage, but I, I'm not. You need to read it. And hopefully you're Bible readers and you'll get to it. So God basically said, uh, so basically the people say we're sick and tired of eating manna. Like, 
our, our soul loathes this light bread. We remember when we used to be back in Egypt and we ate freely and it was all wonderful. Oh, really? You remember the good old days a little different than the good old days really were. And so they're talking about, you know, how wonderful it was. We have this light bread here. It was angel's food that God miraculously put there. But how often do we take for granted something that God has miraculously given us? So the Lord says, uh, the Lord says, fine. Uh, so uh, uh, Moses, Moses comes to the Lord and, and, and he begins to have it out with God. And he just says, you know, I don't understand, Lord, why you put me through this. He goes on and he really has it out with the Lord. And, and this, this issue finally comes to a head. And I'm, I'm telling you, that's what some of you need to start doing. You just need to have it out with God. You just, you just all, you know, stopped up with bitterness and holding it. And then, no, you need to quit praying like these template prayers. <laughs> quit doing that. Quit praying prayers that have absolutely no heart behind it and get down at your knees and take from the very inside of you and pour out your whole self before the Lord. Amen. Amen. When's the last time you prayed and you prayed with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind? Put your whole entire energy into it. I mean, quit having these little rinky-dink prayers. I'm talking about, look, it is about time you quit fooling around at an altar and it's about time you just told God the way it really is from your heart with no filter because he already knows. He just wants to hear you say it. But unfortunately, you go telling everybody else instead. Now, the able men were not able to get the job done. <laughs> Uh, they were able, but they weren't able. Notice in Numbers 11 and verse 11, he says, And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? That was the way he looked at his ministry. <laughs> and wherefore... <laughs> that was kind of funny. <laughs> and wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight? Now here's what he says. That thou layest the burden of all this people upon me. When back in Exodus, Jethro said, these guys will be there. They'll help you with the burden. And now he's saying, I had the, all the burden of this people on me. So obviously it didn't work out. That's why it's satanic advice. It wasn't from the Lord. It came from the wrong place. All about making it easier for him. <clears throat> now God has to show Moses something. And God has to show Moses what he actually is able to know about people. There's not a whole lot you can know about people because you don't know what's going on in the heart. You don't know. But here's what he tells them in Numbers 18 and verse 21. He says, and Moses, no, that's the, why did I say Numbers 18? I don't know. Numbers 11. Uh, yes, no, 16. Numbers 11, 16. Oh, okay, I know what I was doing. <laughs> so Exodus 18, 21, I'm trying to hurry. And so I was cross-referencing that with Numbers 11, 16, because in Numbers 18, 21, Jethro tells them, pick you out people, and I already pointed it out to you, able men, fear God, was it covetous, and, and something else. All right, and then now he goes here, and this is what the Lord says. He says in verse 16, And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be elders of the people. Now, he knew they were elders of the people because if you have cross-references there to Exodus 24, 1 and verse 9, the 70 elders had been there. He already knew. And by the way, here's something interesting, Doc. Notice, oh man, I, I wrote it down. Notice, oh, notice verse 26. There's two guys that don't come, okay? It says, but, they were, but there remained in the, uh, two of the men in the camp, the name of the one Eldad, the name of the other Medad, and the Spirit rested upon them, and they were of them that were written. And I thought about that, and I thought for a second, you know what? Everything I need to know is written. <laughs> and everything Moses needed to know was written. And what you need to know is written. Get into the book. Now, all he knew was these men were elders. That's all he knew. He knew who the 70 elders were. Exodus chapter 24 and verse 1 and verse 9 tell you that he took 70 men up with him. There are certain things you can know about people, certain things you can't. I'm almost done. I only have a couple more minutes. Now, I want to tell you this. There, like I said, there are certain things you, can, you know about people and certain things you can't know. You cannot make anyone spiritual. Just like you cannot make someone a success in the ministry. 
You just can't do it. You can pray for them, but you can't do it. Um, <clears throat> now, notice what the Lord does in verse, uh, verse 17. So he tells them to get the, uh, the elders of Israel. And verse 17, he says, And I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take the Spirit which is upon thee and put it upon them. So I'm going to take the Spirit of Moses. That's on Moses. The Spirit's on upon thee. I'm going to put it on them. Verse 25, And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him and took the Spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied. And I, I'm, I thought, like, what Spirit is that? Like, There's more than one Spirit. What, what Spirit is it that he's putting on? Is it like, I don't know, what is it? Is it like a human Spirit? What is it? Well, that's why you just got to keep reading. <laughs> and in verse 29, And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put His Spirit upon them. The Spirit that was on Moses and the reason why Moses was able to get the job done is because the Lord's Spirit was on him. So look, I'm done. You know what we need? We need Spirit-filled men. When you got saved, you got the Holy Spirit of God. All right, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. There's a spiritual circumcision that took place, and now you are sealed unto the day of redemption. But are you filled with the Spirit of God? Paul said, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Dr. Ruckman used to give the illustration. You guys remember about the tea kettle. And what it is, you get a tea kettle, and in that tea kettle, you put water. You take that water, you put it, you, that tea kettle, you put it on a fire. Or if you have an electric stove, you put it on there, the heat begins to uh, make that water boil. And at first, nothing's happening, but then as the thing it stays there for a while, it starts to heat up and that water begins to change form and turns into a gaseous state. When it turns to a gaseous state, it begins to fill up the whole entire thing. As it begins to fill up the whole entire container, it's looking for an exit. And because it, the only exit that's on there is that little whistle, next thing you know, it starts making some noise. And that's how you know that the water has been boiled. So the Word of God, one of the things the Word of God is like is like fire. You know what's happening to you this week? What's happening to you is you've gotten a fire underneath you. You've shouted, you screamed, yet that, that tea kettle, woo, it's coming out your mouth. You just got to say something. You're boiling on the inside. Things are going well, but it doesn't stay that way. It doesn't stay that way because you're going to go home and all of a sudden your life's going to get real. You're going to go back and you're going to be around your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers. And if you don't stay in the Word of God and learn how to get along with God, you will never be a Spirit-filled Christian. You've got to stay in the book. You've got to stay on your knees. We need Spirit-filled Christians here today. We need spirit-filled Christians much more than we need talented ones. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, it says, And the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Ability doesn't come first. If you have ability, praise God for it. Use it for Him, but don't lean on it. Don't rely on it. All right, that's enough.